first poetry. The pattern was studied, so involved, so intricate. Each knitter poured over it, studied it well, each hoping to create a masterpiece. How could there be perfection, they thought, as they stared at the pattern, so intricate, each determined to succeed the best that she could. Each knit at her own speed, with her own methods. It wasn't a race, there wasn't a winner, but a chance to achieve one's, one, achieve one's own success. Wendy was one who worked on each stitch, these stitches that make up the pattern of life, careful stitches of a daughter, sister, wife, mother, and grandmother. Wendy worked on each stitch with love for Hashem, for her people, for all people, for animals, for nature, each stitch with her trademark of caring and sharing. The stitches of a student so eager to learn, the stitches of a teacher so willing to share with and learn from her students, stitch, stitches of passion to help others succeed. These stitches were filled with traits so outstanding, stitches of patience, stitches of modesty, stitches of love, stitches of passion to give to others. Wendy, so humble, so kind, giving and loving, was meticulous with each and every intricate stitch, creating a legacy, a beautiful masterpiece. We miss you, Wendy. So good evening to the Hearts family, um, to friends, to community members, we welcome you all. Wendy had so much love for Hashem, for Torah, and for learning. In her merit, we welcome tonight Mrs. Esther Eisenman from New York. Esther is the Minahelet principal at Midrash Shell Hebbett High School in North Woodmere, New York. She is a graduate of Stern College for Women and NYU School of Law. She has earned master's degrees in Judaic studies and in educational administration. Esther told me that before the invention of Easy Pass, there was a certain toll booth collector who liked to entertain himself by guessing the occupation of each driver he met. Whenever Esther would pass through his booth, he would look at her and say, teacher, right? And she would respond amused, actually, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> Esther guesses that this man knew something that she didn't because after 10 years as an attorney, she found her true calling as an educator. Esther says that in the legal world, they try to prepare you to be quick on your feet, but she found that that's nothing compared to what's expected of a teacher. The classroom far surpasses the courtroom in its energy and electrifying give and take. We welcome Esther tonight who will present Reaching New Heights, Learning the Lessons of Fana. Welcome Esther. Thanks, and if you don't believe me, try doing what I'm about to do in front of teenagers, and you'll, you'll have a sense of what it's like to be an educator. Um, so when we first spoke about this, um, when we first spoke about this, and uh, Serena gave me a description of what Wendy Aleha Hashalom had been like, she struck me, some, so many of the characteristics struck me as um, reminiscent of Hannah, and that's why I chose Hannah for tonight's talk. But there's a lot of depth to Hannah, and I always like to start every shir, um, especially tonight, the shir of Zecher Nishmat Yehudit Hartz, um, Wendy Hartz, in memory of Wendy. Um, I always like to start every shir with a question. And the question is, um, Hana is known for, Hana is famous for her prayer. Um, Hana, in many ways, um, has set the paradigm for us for prayer, and she was a leader in this regard. And my question is, what did she know that we don't about prayer? What did she know that we don't know? Um, how can we better ourselves as people by studying the story of Hana? It's not obvious at first. Um, but I invite you to take a look at the source sheets that were on your seats. And let's take a look at the story together. It's an interesting story. I'm going to read it with you in English. And, um, and let's discuss it. Okay. And while we go, I think you'll see some of the characteristics that you knew in Wendy. And maybe you can point them out to me as we go as well. 
Obviously, I didn't know Wendy, um, but based on what I've heard, I believe that this story will touch upon some of what she was all about. Okay, so let's start. There was a man from Ramatayim of the Sufites um, in the hill country of Ephraim. His name was Elkanah, the son of Yerocham, the son of Eliyahu, the son of Tohu, the son of Tzuf, and he was an Ephraimite. He had two wives, one named Chana and the other named Penina. Penina had children, but Chana was childless. This is already, by the way, a recipe for disaster. Um, you should never, ever, ever, men never have two wives. This never works. And women, try not to share your husband with another woman. That doesn't work either. But here they were, and Penina had children, and Chana was childless. We've seen this story before. It's not the first time it happens in, in Torah. Okay, let's get back to our story. This man used to go up every year to worship and to offer sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, to Hashem at Shiloh. Chofni and Pinchas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord there. So I don't want to jump the gun, but I'm just going to jump ahead to tell you one detail. If you don't mind turning to, um, to page five in your handout, we're going to just jump ahead for a second to chapter two. And in chapter two, it's a little confusing because Hannah already has her child here, but the important verse is verse 12 of chapter two, where it says, Ailey's sons were scoundrels. They paid no heed to the Lord. So that's, that's kind of important to understand what's happening even in chapter one. Um, they go to a place, they go to bring their sacrifices to Hashem, but the people in charge were scoundrels. And that's an important piece of our social setting. Okay. So let's get back to our story as it unfolds. One such day, meaning this happens every single year, and on one of those days, Elkanah offered a sacrifice. He used to give portions to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. And to Hannah, he would give, to Hannah, he would give one choice or double portion. It's hard to know how to translate this. Um, mana achat apayim, one portion, either it means one portion times two, or it means one portion that was really a super good portion of the, of the sacrifice, of the offering. Um, for he loved Hannah, for the Lord had closed her womb. So we don't know if he loved Hannah because the Lord had closed her womb like he felt sorry for her, or did he love her and want to appease her sadness um, for her childlessness by giving her this really, really yummy piece of the sacrifice? Now, women, when you're really, really, really sad, is that what you want? Like a really good piece of meat? No. Okay, just checking. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't the only one that found that surprising that his gift to his wife when she's sad is to give her an extra special piece of meat. Okay, let's keep going. Um, moreover, her rival, to make her miserable, would taunt her that the Lord had closed her womb. Well, that's a really pretty family picture, isn't it? Okay, but anybody remember learning anything about Penina before today? Do we know why she did this? Can we imagine why she did this? Let's just take good motives aside. Why might two women that share a husband be not nice to each other? Do I really have to ask that question? <laughs> Why might they be not nice to each other? Let me hear from you. What did he just do? What did the husband just do? It's a little envy, right? Because Penina has children, Hannah doesn't, but Hannah seems to have the affection of her husband which Penina may or may not have, but it does say outright that he loved Hana. We don't know how he felt about Penina. Um, so if we don't want to attribute good motives to her, then perhaps she was just mean because it's a difficult situation and they just weren't getting along. Yes, your hand was up in the back. I could 
couldn't agree with you more. I do agree. And we're going to come back to that point. Um, what's your name? Leah. Leah? Leah? Leah. Leah just pointed out that um, maybe he was doing the best he can. That when we're going back to the whole idea of Elkanah giving his wife this, you know, extra special piece of meat or a double piece of meat or whatever it is, um, and maybe this was just what he had. This was the best idea that he had, and it was what spoke to him. And we all do that, right? If I would say to you, come on, what should I get her for her birthday? You're all going to tell me what you want for your birthday, right? Like, that's just human nature. So we tend to give the gifts that we would like to receive ourselves, and perhaps Elkanah was doing that. I happen to agree with you, Leah. I think Elkanah is a very good person, but I'm also trying to paint a picture of Chana here. Um, so let's get back to Elkanah in a moment. Only because I don't want you to leave here tonight with a very, very bad impression of Penina. Let's just jump and look at some brief commentary on the character of Penina and why she wanted to make her, um, her rival, as she is called, miserable. And if you look on page eight of your sources, you will see some commentary on this verse. Um, and the verse says, moreover, her rival, to make her miserable, would taunt her um, because the Lord had closed her womb. So the rival is Penina. I actually made an assumption when I read the text. You didn't catch me on it. Um, pay attention. Sometimes I like to be sneaky and sneak things in. But definitely you should stay on your toes. Um, so, okay, so the woman who was her rival was in fact this other wife, was Penina. And what did she do? Um, this is a very um, commonly known story about Penina, that um, she would always say, and if you look at what I have as source number six, um, she would say to her, the last two lines, or the last three lines, depending on how it's broken on your page, um, did you buy your older son a cloak today, or did you get that shirt for your younger son? Meaning, it's the kind of thing that one woman would say to another right around the holiday time. Like, oh my God, I have so much to do. The kids are growing up. I need to buy new clothes for all of them. They outgrow their stuff so quickly. And I've got to cook, and we've got to pack, and we've got to go to Jerusalem for the holiday. It's so much work. It's so much work. And all the, all the, new, all the little kids need new shoes. They've all outgrown their shoes. They all need new shoes. Oh, I'm sorry, Hannah. You don't have any children. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bring that up. In other words, that's what Rashi would have us believe Penina is doing. So why would Penina do that? Clearly she knows she doesn't have children. They share a home. It's not something she would likely forget. Um, but Rashi goes on to explain that um, in order she should complain, she would do this, Penina would do this in order to make Chana upset so that she would pray. And Penina had good intentions. Um, the source is given here as coming from the Gemara, um, Baba, uh, Baba Basra. And the idea is that Penina wanted to make Chana pray. She felt that Chana, Chana was sad, and Chana was lacking something in life that she desperately wanted, and Penina was trying to find a backdoor way to motivate her to reach out in her pain to Hashem and do what needs to be done. Now, if I were to ask you right now, we'll come back to Elkanah in a moment, is Penina good or bad? Just as a person, what do you think? Are her motives good? Like, what is, what's happening here? You vote Penina yes? Penina, you're team Penina? or not team Penina. You're team Penina. You're thinking Penina's trying to do a good thing. Anybody not on team Penina? What do you think? It's none of her business. It might not be any of her business, or the, although we are supposed to care about one another, and help each other see the right way out of a problem. Comfort her, but don't, or you want to tell her what you think, but don't make her feel bad. So was there any way for Penina to accomplish her goals without torturing Chana? Right? Is there any other way for her to have done it other than to really make Chana sadder than she already was? That's, right. So that's... That's the dilemma, I think, with Penina. I think she is very, very well motivated, but she perhaps goes about this in the wrong way. Perhaps. Um, 
We also have other rabbinic sources that Panina is punished for this, for, for the way she goes about this. So it's not a crazy idea to say perhaps Panina is not on the right track. Okay, let's keep reading. This happened year after year. Every time she, meaning Chana, went up to the house of the Lord, the other would taunt her so that she wept and would not eat. Oh, now we know why she doesn't want to eat, she doesn't have children, Panina's torturing her. She's really in a state. Her husband, Elkanah, said to her, Chana, why are you crying and why aren't you eating? Why are you so sad? Am I not more devoted to you than ten sons? Now let's just take a minute and talk about Elkanah for a minute. And then we're going we're gonna to wind our way back to Chana. Let's talk about Elkanah. You on team Elkanah or you on team not so Elkanah? Think Elkanah's a good guy? What's he doing? He's a good guy. He cares about Chana, correct? We've seen that already. Right. Elkanah right. cares. What? He tries to console her. He tries to console her with what he knows, that manly piece of meat. Perhaps that will help her. I know. I like a good steak. He's thinking. Steak is not, I love steak, by the way. Steak is not comfort food. Not for women. I don't think. I don't think. I don't like saying that. It's not generalization, but I think it's, it's not. I also, I remember teaching this to high school students many years ago, and one of them said, I'm a salmon size man. She was upset, so why didn't she eat? I said, because when you're upset, you don't eat. He goes, no, I don't understand, what are you talking about? And the girls in the class were saying, when you're really upset about something, you can't eat. And he's saying, I don't understand why he didn't eat. So I went home that night, and I said to my husband and my son, I said, when you're like really upset about something, do you ever like lose your appetite? And they said, yeah, it happens all the time. So there are also men who lose their appetite when they don't eat. This one student of mine was insisting that that doesn't happen to men. And perhaps that's the piece that Elkanah is missing. He doesn't know that women lose their appetite when they're very sad, perhaps. Um, but does, does Elkanah and Penina have something in common? Like, they're, they're feeling sorry for Hana. They want to motivate her. They want to con he wants to console her. She wants to motivate her. But perhaps they're not going about it the right way. Because far be it for me to say that Elkanah might have missed something about his wife that he loved so much, but he did this every year. And every year she didn't eat. You might have thought at some point he'd have brought diamond earrings. Or, I don't know, a glass of wine. Something that would cheer her up besides the extra piece of the sacrifice. Why was he doing this again and again? Didn't help. Didn't help last year didn't help the year before, didn't help the year before that. This happened year after year, and nobody figured out a better way to make this work. Nobody's figuring this out. So if you're Chana during all of this, how are you feeling right about now? How are you feeling? Terrible. Not so good, right? No, no, really no. worse. Because why? She has a husband who loves her, but what, what does he not? He loves her, we know that, it says that in the text, black and white. He loves her, but he doesn't understand, understand her. She has this Panina, who even in her best motivation, goes about it in a way that's painful. Even in her best motivation. And so she's surrounded by people that seem to care about her. But nobody really understands her or is able to reach her in her pain and her sadness. So when I'm thinking of Hana right now at this moment, I'm feeling she's pretty lonely. That's the word I'm looking for. I'm feeling like Hana is pretty lonely. The one thing I want to point out about Hana at this moment in time, I see you have a question, I'll get right to you. When I'm thinking about Hana right now, is that she comes every year and she takes it. She takes it from Panina, she takes it from Elkanah, and I'm not suggesting that this is, um, no, never mind, ignore that suggestion piece. She's essentially the most kind-hearted person in the story. People keep hurting her by missing a point, and she is just so good to everyone around her. And we'll see that as the story plays out. She remains good despite what has befallen her, despite what everybody around her is. They're trying to help her, and they're not getting it, and she's just going along with it. 
She's trying. Okay. Um, after they ate and drank at Shiloh, Anna rose. The priest Eli, remember, his sons were priests of Hashem. We saw that already in verse 3. Eli's sons were priests, and they were scoundrels. Okay. So Eli, the father of the scoundrels, was sitting on the seat near the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. In her wretchedness, she prayed to the Lord, she being Chana, weeping all the while. And she made this vow. O oh, Lord of hosts, if you will look upon the suffering of your maidservant, and you will remember me and not forget your maidservant, and if you will grant your maidservant a lineage of great men, and I'll read the Hebrew for you in a moment, I will dedicate him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor shall, touch his, shall ever touch his head. So she makes this little deal. We always make deals with God. Never worked for me yet. Right? But well, we always make these deals with God. Just, you know, get me out of this situation and I'll never speak bad about another person again. Whatever it is. Whatever is your downfall. It doesn't always work. It works for Chana. And the question is why? What is it about this particular prayer that gets Chana what she wants? What is it about this prayer that gets Chana what she wants? It's a pretty unusual prayer. It looks like a classic bargain. And one thing I always teach my students is that God is not a vending machine, and it's very hard to strike a bargain with God. When I go to a vending machine, I still think I'm in high school, so I, I always say I take 35 cents, and I put it in, and I press C7, but you can't get anything for 35 cents anymore. Um, but take a dollar 35, and you press C7, and you get the Kit Kat bar. That's just the way vending machines work. Right? God doesn't work that way. You can't say, if you give me this, I'll give you that. It just, I'll give you $1.35, God, can you just make the Kit Kat bar appear here? doesn't work. I'll say it all day long. It's not going to happen. So what is it about this bargain that makes God say, oh, that's a really good idea, Fana. I'm going to give you your baby. And this, I think, is what separates Hana from so many other people in Tanakh. This is what makes Hana great. This is really what makes Hannah great. I think there's also something very peculiar about this prayer. If you're ever in a situation where you want something, or especially children, most people don't want children so that they can give them to somebody else. Right? That's a pretty unusual bargain. Just give me a baby, and I'll give him back to you. That's a pretty unusual bargain. Most people want a baby because they want a baby. My daughter's at home now, expecting, with uh, my third grandchild. She's not feeling well today. Um, I left her home. I took the kids out. It was great fun. I'll tell you the truth. I'm not offering that baby to anybody else. <laughs> that's going to be my baby. <laughs> that's, that's, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be so much fun. I'm going to play with the baby. The baby's going to see Bubby, and I'm going to be like, oh. Sure, what? That's part of the fun. That's why you want to have a baby. Why would you want to have a baby and give him back to God? That seems very counterproductive. She was praying for a child, and the bargaining chip she used was giving the child back to God. It's very unusual. It's very unusual. Why did she want that? Why did she want that? She wanted to show her sincerity that she not only wanted this for herself as the expected mother, but she realized that if God gives her, Hashem gives her this baby, she wants that baby to have a connection with Hashem. But she's actually giving him back. She's going to, by the end of chapter 2, bring him to the temple. Well, it's not really the temple at that point. It's the Mishkan, the tabernacle. And she's going to leave him with Eli, who has raised these two corrupt sons, these scoundrels. It's a great translation. You don't get to use the word scoundrel enough in English. Um, but these two scoundrels, and, and she's going to leave her child with this man. 
instead of raising him herself. But I do think you're right. She doesn't really want the child for herself. I am the selfish grandmother in the room. I want that baby so I can play with, so I have a baby to play with. Hannah wanted something else. We'll talk about Hannah again in a minute. I raised that question, I'll get right back to it. Look at what she asks for. Where is it in Hebrew? V'natata la'amatcha zera anashem, the Pasuk says in Hebrew. And if you give to your servant, and by the way, look how many times she calls herself the servant of Hashem. Okay, that's also a clue. Um, which I, what you were very tied to the idea that you raised, she wanted to acknowledge that it's not just about her, that really it's all about Hashem, right? She keeps calling herself the servant of Hashem. We're all servants of Hashem. We are all servants of Hashem. And Khan is saying, I am your servant, I am your servant, I am your servant. And if you want to do something nice for your servant, this is what I would please ask for, and this is what I'll give you in exchange. And so there's this, she's already putting herself into a certain context with relation to Hashem, but she says, if you give me Zerah on Hashem, so I think I caught an Israeli accent earlier in the audience. Did I catch an Israeli accent earlier in the audience when I was saying hello to some people? No? Okay. So Zerah, as is translated, is lineage, and on Hashem is people, but it's really great people. Usually in Torah, when we see the word ish, it means not just a man, it means a man of importance. He's, he's a man, and he's a, a leader, and not just a guy. Zera Anashem, a lineage of great men. So like on one hand, I'm saying she's giving the baby back. On the other hand, I'm saying she might be a little piggish here. She's not just asking for a child. She's asking for this lineage of great men. Why? Go ahead. If she was a an and she had If she was, say that again. You know, I should know the answer to this question. Is Hannah one of the, is Hannah listed? Hannah's listed as a prophet? Right. That's an interesting twist. I will tell you, though, I agree with you, and where I was going was someplace very similar. I don't even think she needed prophecy to figure it out. She's coming to the holy place. The holy place is run by scoundrels. She's married to a very nice man who doesn't get her pain. The woman in the next bedroom is trying to help her, but really hurting her along the way. Society is really in a bad place right now. And we're going to see in another few verses that when Hannah tries to pray, Eli mistakes her prayer for drunkenness. We're going to see that in about a minute. And so even in the place, even in the place that is serving as a temple, the high priest doesn't recognize prayer when he sees it. I wanted to suggest that the world around her is so corrupt and Hannah is motivated by two things. Yes, to have a family, and Hannah does go on to have more children after she has Shmuel, but Hannah really wants to change the world. Hannah wants to change society around her. Hannah wants to have influence and make the world a better place. The world isn't such a good, great place today either, you know what I'm saying? Like, this isn't uh, an uncommon phenomenon. And sometimes we just don't know what to do to make a difference. And I'm going to say something, as a woman, that might be surprising to you. But at this point in history, as a woman, Hannah had no clout to make a change. And she asks not just for a child, she asks for a son, a great son, 
And he's not just going to be a great son. He's going to give her a lineage of great sons. And it's not, it doesn't exactly, it's not exactly borne out the way you might read. It's not that Shmuel has another son who's great, who has another son who's great. He might. And there are definitely sources that indicate that. But really what Shmuel does is bring true greatness to the Jewish people because Shmuel is the one to anoint the first king of Israel and then David as well. And so Shmuel, Shmuel brings greatness to the Jewish people by anointing a lineage which then takes over as the king of Israel. And so he is greatness. He ushers. He himself is a great man. We don't have time to read the whole story of Shmuel today. You're going to have to trust me on this or go home and read it for yourself. But Shmuel himself is a great man and he puts a greater man in power. And so she asks for someone who can help her change the world and she, that's what she gets. She gets someone who can help her change the world. There is nothing else like, there's no other story like this in Tanakh anywhere where somebody makes a bargain with God. Abram tries to strike a bargain with God when God says to him, like, um, I'm going to kill this city, and he goes, oh, 50 people, 45 people, 40 people, but that's... So this doesn't, again, that doesn't happen too often. Usually, um, there's a whole discussion because it says that no razor shall ever touch his head. He will be a Nazir. A Nazarite usually appoints himself. It's usually not something that you have that's foisted upon you by others. Um, there are two sources. There's Shimshon, and it's not even really, really, really clear if that's what's happening here with Shmuel. Um, but this whole idea of like greatness being foisted upon him by others, that's pretty unique to this story. That's pretty unique to this story. Although we do see later in the story that, um, we do see later in the story that uh, Elkanah says to her, you do whatever you think is right. Um, it's possible that Hannah, although she really can't take leadership of society, it might be clear that she wears the pants in the family. I don't know. Like, at least in that moment, in that relationship. Because when she tells her husband what he's done, what she's done, he says, then you got to do what you said you were going to do. So, um, kind of really, as I said, where are we? I'm keeping track of time. Hana really wants to make a difference in the world around her. And, and she feels that this is her way. I also want to point out, and this is just sort of a point about prayer. And that is that, again, I've mentioned this before. This happened year after year after year. He's giving her the meat, she's not eating the meat, Panina's torturing her, she's crying, year after year. This whole scene replays itself. This must be the first time that she says what she says. This is the first time she either prays or she makes this prayer in particular because this is the first time she gets a child. And this is the first time we know anything about this prayer. And it's not said, and as she did every year, she says this prayer. So it's a very interesting point about prayer. Sometimes you pray for the same thing again and again and again. She must have prayed for children before today. But she prays and prays and prays and prays until clarity comes to her. And she finally understands what it is that she needs to ask for. And it's not just a baby, but it's sort of the baby. Maybe she realizes the world around her and she are not on the same wavelength. She's seeing problems that maybe other people aren't seeing. And she knows she's got to take responsibility for fixing them. And then all of a sudden, a light goes on, and she knows what she needs to do. And this very interesting aspect of prayer, because we always feel like, well, I was just here last year in Kippur, and I just did this already. Um, but I think this can give us insight into prayer, that you really can have that sort of light bulb moment um, where your prayer will change, and in a way that it can even change you and your, your judgment. Um, another thing I want to say about prayer, because this is such a ripe and rich story about prayer, Another thing I wanted to say about prayer is that um, to get your prayer answered, 
You have to, and, and you can't always do it, right? Because God really isn't a vending machine. Like, she just like cracked the code, and this might be a one-time thing, right? Um, God really isn't a vending machine, but you really have to know what to ask for. She doesn't just ask for the child, she asks for a child that can help her make a difference and help God make a difference. So again, how you phrase your prayer makes all the difference. Just a couple of points about prayer, things that I personally learned from Hana um, that I'd like to share. Okay, so now I'm going on to verse 12. She kept on praying before the Lord. Ailey watched her mouth. Now Hana was praying in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice could not be heard. Now I'm just going to stop before I finish the sentence. Um, that's how we pray today. And that is where the laws of prayer come from, right from this verse that we, we mouth the words, but we don't um, speak our prayer, especially not Shemona Esrei. Other prayers we do say out loud, but the essence of prayer, which is the, you know, Shemona Esrei, we, we just move our lips. We learn that from Hana right here. And as I said earlier, you know, in frustration, Ailey thought she was drunk. Um, he sees a woman praying, and he thought she was drunk. Rabbi, when you see a person moved completely in prayer in your synagogue, and they're feeling connected to God, and they're beseeching Hashem, did you ever mistake them for a drunken person? You didn't have the Urba Tomim that said, Kesheira, Kesara, Shikora, right. It's a great midrash, that's right. Um, he might have been misled by... The answer is no. So Ailey, again, I'm really not trying to make everybody into the devil in the story. I'm just really trying to make Hannah and I was the heroine. You understand, even the good people in the story are making mistakes, but, which is fine. We all make mistakes. All good people make mistakes. But Hannah is the one that's cutting through it all. And Ailey, Ailey thought she was drunk. What does this tell us? It tells us Ailey's not so, so sure what davening really is supposed to look like. And I'm not saying it's Ailey's fault. I'm saying your rabbi here has seen a lot more good prayer than Ailey did. Ailey, who is operating in the holiest place that we had in Israel at the time, could not have seen that much prayer. Because when he sees a true heartfelt prayer, he gets confused by it and thinks, what is happening here? This woman's crying, her lips are moving. Um, isn't that a song, my lips are moving? Okay, never mind. Um, and he thinks she's drunk. It doesn't make sense um, that he thinks so. And he says that to her. Ailey said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? So up. And Hannah said, oh no, my lord. I am just a very unhappy woman. I have drunk no wine or other strong drink. I have been pouring out my heart to the Lord. Do not take your maidservant for a worthless woman. I have only been speaking all this time out of my great anguish and distress. Great. So he, he, he understood. And then he said, go in peace. Um, and may the Lord of Israel grant you what you asked of him with just, you know, a nice resolution. And she answered, you are most kind to your handmaid. So the woman left, and she ate, and she was no longer downcast. Why did she eat? What changed? A few things changed, really. What changed? Somebody was listening to her. Hopefully Hashem, but even Ailey. That connection with the other person, look what it does. Look how it lifts you up. This is what you, when you described Wendy, this is the part that I was thinking of. How she, how that connection with another human can really lift you up. That caring, that reaching out. She was understood. And hopefully, hopefully she even felt something come back to her from from Hashem. When you daven, a really good davening, you know it. You know what I'm saying? You know it. When you pray and you really had your heart in it, you know it. So maybe just leaving her problems with Hashem, but to me, so powerful to say, Ailey understood her. Ailey got it. And she felt lifted up. She was able to become and eat. Now, she had no idea if she was actually going to have a baby after this prayer, but she still feels better. That, to me, that was what Ailey did. Early the next morning, they, did, they bowed before the Lord, they went back, 
Elkanah knew his wife, one of the great euphemisms of the Torah. Man knowing his wife is sexual relations, of course, and the Lord remembered her. Um, Hannah, conceived, Hannah conceived, and at the turn of the year, she bore a son. She named him Shmuel, meaning I asked the Lord for him, and when the man Elkanah and his household were going up to offer to the Lord the annual sacrifice and his votive sacrifice, Hannah did not go up. She said to Hashem, when the, what she said to her husband, when the child is weaned, I will bring him, for when he has appeared before the Lord, he must remain there for good. Which, by the way, is a little bit of a bait and switch. Notice how she didn't mention it until after he's born. Oh, I forgot to mention. There's this little promise that I made. I might have to give him back. Sorry, but I can't bring him there until I'm ready to leave him. So I'm going to keep him. And her husband said to her, do what you think is best. Stay home until you've weaned him. May the Lord fulfill his word. Um, and I think what he meant by may the Lord fulfill his word is, is by bringing greatness to their son. So the woman stayed home and nursed her son until he was weaned. She weaned him, then she took him up with her. Right Next time they go up to Jerusalem, to Shiloh, sorry. I said Jerusalem earlier, I really meant Shiloh. I apologize. Um, when she had weaned him, she took him up along with her, along with three bowls, one a file of flour, a jar of wine. Although the boy was still very young, she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. Weaning is typically three. When we see weaning in the Bible, it's typically age three. So she's bringing really um, a little three-year-old to go live with Ailey in Shiloh. And after slaughtering the bull, they brought the boy to Ailey. And she said, please, my Lord, as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you and prayed to the Lord. It was for this boy I prayed. The Lord has granted me what I asked of him. Um, I, tur I turn hereby, oops, I in turn hereby lend him to the Lord. For as long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And they bowed low there before the Lord. So she does it. She brings her son up and leaves him with, um, with, um, with Ailey. But I think that's not the most important part of the story. Because my, one of my questions that's not really answered is, although it is true a mother um, has uh, an influence on a child in the first three years of a child's life, we don't really have memories yet. Very few people have memories before they're three. So how is it sufficient that and if she's trying to change society through this child, you know, keeping him till he's three, is that really making such a difference to society? Um, unless we have to read chapter two for the answer for that question. Okay, um, and I'm going to skip the first ten verses. When, when our rabbis list the ten um, great songs of, uh, well, I don't know if Tefillah Chana is one of them. Let me let me say it differently. When we say Tefillat Chana, we tend to be referring to what's in chapter 2, not what's in chapter 1. Chapter 1 is definitely also a Tefillah, and it is called a Tefillah, it is called a prayer by the verse, but this is the famous one, it's the song of thanksgiving that she sings, it is, it is a song, because it's, she thanks Hashem for giving her the, the child. I'm going to skip it. It's poetic, it's beautiful. Um, and it shows us more about the nature of Hannah, about the appreciation she has um, for the goodness that she saw. She attributes all of the goodness in the birth of Shmuel to God, um, and that's great. Okay, point taken. Let's move on. Let's go to the bolded sentence, verse 11. Then Elkanah and Hannah went home to Ramah. The boy entered the service of the Lord under the priest Eli. We've already seen that. Now Eli's sons were scoundrels. They paid no heed to the Lord. I brought that in earlier because I wanted you to understand the context of what is happening in Shiloh, what is happening in this mini version of the temple. And when I say temple, I mean the temple with a capital T, right? This is the main place of worship of the Jews at this point. Um, we see immediately a contrast between Shmuel and Eli's sons. Eli's sons are scoundrels. And the rest, of the, the rest of the chapter is really telling us some of the bad things that they did to the people that would come to worship Hashem. Um, and then I'm going to skip ahead because we don't really care exactly how bad they are. Um, let's go ahead to verse 18. Shmuel was engaged in the service of the Lord as an attendant, girded with a linen a fode. His mother would also bring a little robe for him and bring it up every year when she made the pilgrimage with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. One second. 
Let me just read the Hebrew there for a minute. Even though the English makes it sound like it could only be clear that she brings him this coat every year, I will tell you in the Hebrew it is not fully clear. There's more than one way to translate this verse. Um, and I, I just want to pay homage to it because it's, it's a very interesting idea. Um, let's get back to the coat. Let's get back to the coat. Hang on to the coat. And, and what's going on with the coat? Hang on to the coat. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, it's really Eli. Um, Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, may the Lord grant you offspring by this woman in the place of the loan she made to the Lord. Then they would return home. For the Lord took note of Hannah. She conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Um, young Samuel, meanwhile, grew up in the service of the Lord. Right? I just wanted to make sure you all knew that there was a happy ending. Right? Hannah goes on to have more children besides Shmuel. Um, whom she gives to um, God. And then again, I didn't bold it, but uh, verse 26, young Samuel, meanwhile, grew in esteem and favor both with God and men. So Shmuel really is uh, starting off on the right foot. Let's talk about the coat. Very interested in the coat. They understand that Wendy was one for sewing and making things. And when I told Soretta that I was going to talk about Hana, and the coat, I said I could weave the coat in, no pun intended, and so you got have to talk about the coat. That's Wendy's strength, crafts, making. So let's talk about the coat. Let's talk about the coat. Um, also, I have Wendy's children here. We can talk a little bit about mothering. When you were little and we went outside, did your mother say, do you have your coat on? Do you have your gloves on? Do you have your scarf on? Because that's what mothers do, right? Maybe, trying to remember, but that's what mothers do. They take care of their kids. They make sure that when they need to go outside, they have what they need. Was your mother kind to open the door and say, just go play in traffic and come home when you're ready? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much? <laughs> a little closer to that. A little closer to that. But she at least bought you a coat every year, right? Yes. There were coats involved in the process. Man, this is Chicago. It's cold here, okay? I know she got you a coat. Um, but there's, there's something very symbolic about a coat. I can think of two symbols of a coat. What, when I say coat, what do you think? It's the first word that comes to your mind. Play a little uh, Rorschach test here. Warmth. 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 So that that's, could also be seen as maternal love. Warmth of a home. He doesn't have the warmth of a home. Charles is sent to live in a dorm when he's three. Um, but his mother's sending him a coat, and the coat is warmth. What else is a coat? What else does a coat do? Let's say it's raining. What? Layer. It's a layer, so it protects you from the elements. Embrace. What? It embraces you. It can embrace you, right? So I'm seeing all of these things as metaphor for mother and home. It's no, it's no accident that she made him a coat. She could have made him a shirt. She could have made him pants. She could have made him a million different things. She made him a coat. Um, what else is a coat? It could be also to Say that again. Sometimes that outer garment, that coat, can be very distinctive and can really be part of a person's identity. In fact, you bring up Joseph's coat, which is very interesting. I wasn't planning on, I wasn't thinking of bringing up Joseph's coat, but Joseph's coat was also very special. Also someone else in Tanakh has a coat. One of Joseph's other brothers has a coat. Actually, lots of them have coats. Lots of them have actually coats, but leaders also have coats. Kings have coats. When we think of kings, I don't know about you, but you say the word king to me, maybe I'll think of the crown, but I always think of that beautiful purple thing that they wear. Right? Like it's so regal. And a coat can be very symbolic. It can also be very symbolic of leadership. We see it in Tanakh. Very often when people's coats are mentioned, leadership is mentioned. Let's start with leadership because it's the most side point. There is this very, very, very interesting verse, much later on in the book of Samuel, after he's already dead. And Saul, it's very, uh, very weird passage, where Saul goes to a witch. Now, witches are not allowed in the Jewish religion. Witches 
are, are forbidden. But there's a witch. It's so obviously a complicated story because we've already got a witch in it and we, you know, it's already complicated. Goes to the witch and he, he, he wants her to conjure somebody. And, um, and, he, and she does. And he says, that, so then if you look at source number 19, which is on the last page or the second to last page that you've got, but source number 19, Saul says to the witch, what does he look like, right? This man that you've conjured, what does he look like? It is an old man coming up, she said, and he's wrapped in a robe, which is another word for coat. Actually, it's a very lousy translation. Why would they do that? <laughs> Why would they translate me'il all the other time as coat, but in this particular verse as robe? I'm sorry I didn't catch that. I should have caught it and changed it. What? It said robe before. It said robe before also? She's making him a robe? Okay, so then they're consistent. Good job. Thank you. I told you, don't let me get away with anything. Thank you for taking me seriously. The, um, and he was wearing a coat, um, and Saul knew that it was Samuel. And he bowed low in homage with his face to the ground. So that's exactly what you said. Just like Joseph's coat is distinctive, Saul's coat, uh, sorry, Samuel's coat is distinctive. When he comes back literally from the dead, he's wearing the coat. He's wearing his mother's coat coat. Hang on to that thought. Um, and then Rashi explains on that particular verse, for he was accustomed to wear a robe, as it said, and his mother would make him a small robe. He was even buried with the robe. And he came back from the dead with his robe. Um, okay. So the code is very distinctive, and it is clearly a part of his leadership and part of his identity, because when he comes back from the dead, Saul knows that it's Samuel once he can see the coat. So, yes, you have your hand up. Um, about the cloak, I think that before Eliana dies, he gives his successor Eliza a cloak. So wouldn't that be the same thing that Eliza Meaning? Yes, oh, 100%. Uh, yeah, he's a leader. He goes around, he gets rid of the idol worship in, in you know, among Israel. Like, he really makes a difference to the people, even before he anoints Saul and then David. He, he does a great job. He, he is a, an amazing leader. Um, but, so, okay. So this is distinctive of leadership. And his mother gave him the coat. Would it be very, would it be a terrible assumption to make that this is also another way of saying that her influence on him lasts his whole lifetime, even beyond the grave? In other words, the coat or the robe is the thing she leaves him. And we already saw, she comes back to visit him every year. The coat is the thing she leaves him. There's something about that maternal influence, that thing that she leaves him, that stays with him forever, it becomes identified directly with him and with his leadership. Let's go back to her prayer. What does she want? She doesn't want a man. She wants a great man. What did she get? A great man who wears her influence because she was the one that really wanted to change the world and change society and change the people around her. And she was able to convey that to her child and animate him in what was so important to her. It's a very hard thing to do. You can't always carry the family business to the second generation. No pressure. But she is able to do that. Let's go back to talk about the code itself for a minute. I always liked this version of the story, but Sarada liked the other version of the story, which turned out to be much, the much more common one. If you look at source 21, it repeats the story of Shmuel coming out of the grave, and it says, it's in the Midrash, Midrash Tan Choma, it says an old man is coming up and he is wrapped in a robe. And elsewhere it says, and his mother would make him a little robe, right? So then we know where this coat came from. 
Um, this verse teaches that the robe grew on him. She made him one robe, according to this source, and it grew on him. Now, the Midrash, no Midrash is meant to be taken literally. I don't know if it grew on him or not. I think this is another, and in it he was buried, and in it he rose up. Yeah, I believe that this is another way of saying his mother's influence grew along with him. As he became a greater person, he took with him everything she gave him. That's one way to read it. Maybe as another way to tie in to Wendy, um, we'll look at the other interpretation, which is that um, brought to us in, in uh, source number 18, according to Mitsudat David and, and many others, every year she brought him a new coat according to the body size that grew every year. It would just be logical to say every year when she came to visit, she would bring him another coat, another robe, coat, whatever you want to call it, um, and every year she would bring him another coat. And so Serena was describing this idea of like, well, that would be what Wendy would be doing. She would just be making another coat and like sending it up. Um, and so, you know, we can look at this coat in either, in either approach, either that it grew with him or, uh, or that she was busy, busy back at the ranch making the coats. But that also tells us something very important. It's not just that her influence never left him, it's that her connection to him never left her. Because it did seem, I mean, it does, it could strike one as a little cold to say, I'll have this child anything. I'll just give him back. Just let me have a child. See, it could be a little bit cold, but we see that that's not what Hannah was at all. She is seemingly very busy making coats every year. Either that or she is really, really talented at coat making. And every year she's, you know, chip chop at the coats um, and, and bringing it to him every single year. And so um, just to wrap up with some of the main points that we spoke about Fana this evening and maybe um, tie in a little bit to Wendy. Um, there's that kindness of Fana, the part of Fana that wants to reach out to people, the part of Fana that wants to make connections with people, um, and how much of a difference it can make to someone who might be in the darkness at a moment to be understood to have someone reach out to them. Understanding what's important in life, um, knowing what your goals and values should be, and framing your prayers around them, and then passing along um, what she knew and loved and did so well onto the next generation in order to lend her protection and her leadership into the future. And um, I hope I did justice to the memory of Wendy. I hope you all learned something about Hana. Um, I believe that uh, Hana is a fabulous role model to men and women everywhere, but especially to women um, who don't get as many in the Bible as, as the men do. And so um, I hope we learned something about Hana. Thank you for inviting me this evening. Thank you. <laughs> wanted if there were any questions.